Amen. Welcome, everyone, to our Sunday evening service. Thank God that the rain finally stopped. And uh, we got a couple more people here tonight. What's Dan is singing? 791. This is a song that someone asked me to sing, and we haven't sung it in a long time. That person will remain anonymous. Anon- anonymous? Anonymous. The old book and the old faith. Let's sing the first. We've sung it before. We'll sing the first and last verse. Song 791 as we stand. Verse number one. Mid the storms of doubt and unbelief we fear Stands the book eternal that the world holds dear Through the restless ages it remains the same Tis the book of God and the Bible is its name The old book and the old faith Are the rock on which I stand The old book and the old faith are the bulwark of the land. Through storm and stress they stand the test in every clime and nation blessed. The old book and the old faith are the hope of every land. Verse 4. Is the book that tells us of eternal life After faithful service in a world of strife And this glorious triumph over death's dark fears Is the world's best gift in an age of countless tears The old book and the old faith Are the rock on which I stand The old book and the old faith are the bulwark of the land. Through storm and stress they stand the test in every clime and nation blessed. The old book and the old faith are the hope of every land. Amen. I was going to tell Brother Zach that, wait, we didn't sing the last part, and it says it may be omitted, so... That makes it a lot more sense now. That's good. And uh, well, it's good to see you all here. We all have survived uh, daylight savings time once again. And what a morning for daylight savings. It was raining. It was cold. It was miserable. But the saints of God still showed up. And we had a good service this morning. Of course, there was still a lot of folks out sick and uh, home for different reasons. But I'm thankful for everyone who uh, was able to be here this morning. All the hard work, everyone who stepped up to fill in. Miss Becca got stuck in Philadelphia. She's flying back from seeing Abby and Jason. And uh, Josh and Sheree Berry stepped up, took her place. Mrs. Snyder couldn't get out of her uh, driveway because of mud. And uh, Mrs. Madrano took her, her class. And, and Brother Leonard was sick. And Pastor Josh and Jared took his class. Just everyone working together to figure things out. And I'm, I'm so thankful for that. And uh, thank you for all your hard work and everything that went in. Today, running the bus. I couldn't imagine running the bus on Daylight Saving Sunday. Brother, I'm surprised Brother Will didn't fall asleep at the wheel. Uh, but praise the Lord. Uh, they all got here safely, got home safely. And uh, Brother Willett went to pick up Becca at the airport. Mrs. Willett is flying out tomorrow to go to Nigeria to spend time with Emily. And uh, Emily's home but very weak, so she's going there and going to help nurse her through. And then the Christiansons are coming back April 4th. Uh, for their furlough so she can get her health figured out. And uh, we're just thankful for how the Lord's working in all those different areas. But let's open in prayer, then you can be seated. Lord, I thank you for this church family. I thank you, Lord, for uh, brothers and sisters we have in Christ that we can lean on and depend on and uh, we can go to when we're struggling and to help us bear our burdens and to help encourage us in the Lord and in the Word. I pray, Lord, that you meet with us in a special way tonight. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Give us a good time of of fellowship, increase our faith, and help us to learn something from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. All right, we'll turn to Psalm 477. Psalm 477, we'll sing the first two verses, then we'll have testimony time, channels only, 477. How I praise thee, precious Savior, that thy love laid hold of me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be. Channels only bless 
blessed Master, along with all thy wondrous power. Flowing through us, thou canst choose us every day and every hour. Verse 2, empty that thou shouldest fill me, a clean vessel in thy hand, with no power but as thou givest, graciously with each command. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Flowing through us, thou canst choose us every day and every hour. Good job singing, folks. We'll have testimony time now, and we will start not in the middle rolling. We're going to start on the right-hand side. We'll check on these folks over here, the favorite side, the Christian side, the most blessed, the most holy. There we go, Miss Madrano. Amen. Thank God that most, I think everybody, anybody flood out today besides the, yeah, just sort of, Brother Jimmy, we don't care about him. He's on the left side. <laughs> uh, I think my aunt came back to church today. This is her second week in a row. Did she come last week? Two, two weeks in a row. And she's talked to my uncle who hasn't been in church. And he says he's going to try to come as well. So it's nice that they're both going to try to come. Anybody else on the right hand side, the favorite side? Don't be afraid. All right, the heathen side now, the left-hand side. Brother Carl. Amen. Amen. Thank God for God's forgiveness, and his forgiveness is true forgiveness. Anybody else on my left-hand side? Brother Jim. Amen. Only a half flooding on there. Brother Tim. And Brother Roland, yes, in the middle. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Anybody else on the humble side? Oh, Brother Bruce. And one last go around, Brother Charlie.
for the love of Jesus. Let's go ahead and sing the last two verses. Channels only, 477. Witnessing thy power to save me, setting free from self and sin, thou who brought us to possess me, in thy fullness, Lord, come in. Channels only, me, blessed Master, while with all thy wondrous power, flowing through us, thou canst choose us every day and every hour. Jesus, fill now with thy spirit, hearts that full surrender know that the streams of living water from our inner man may flow. Channels only, blessed Master, while with all thy wondrous power, flowing through us, thou canst choose us every day and every hour. Amen. Just a few announcements. Don't forget, Wednesday night is Victory Kids, and we got a special treat for you this Wednesday night. Hopefully, Brother Zach. Talk to Miss Dorinda. Who oh, no. Uh, but Brother Zach and Miss Dorinda are going to do Victory Kids this Wednesday night. And then uh, Mrs. Willett's going away. We're going to give Brother Willett a little bit of a break. And uh, we'll figure out who's doing Victory Kids the following Wednesday night. Uh, but for this Wednesday night, Brother Zach and Miss Dorinda, that's at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. And then at 6.30, they have a music practice with my wife and Miss Becca. Uh, so if you'd like your kids to be involved in that, get them here a little early. And then no Sunday school teachers meeting this week for us slackers. We are still in the creation book, and we need one more week. But teachers, we need to finish our book up this week. Okay, we're just going to finish it. No matter where you're at, just finish the book uh, because we need to stop delaying and get to the end of this booklet. But no teachers meeting, and that is a benefit from delaying and not getting through your lesson because then I don't have to have the teachers meeting again. So... Uh, anyways, don't catch on to that. And then Saturday is soul winning in the bus ministry at 10, our workers meeting at 945. And I do have this Wednesday night, Miss Haleen, me and you meeting um, for the ministry leader meeting at 630. If you can make it here, if not, we can push it back a little bit. And then this Saturday is our youth activity. It's going to be uh, around one o'clock. Pastor Josh is going and uh, our, do you have any help going with you? Josh and Sheree Barry are going with them. And they're a lot of fun, so it should be good. It is uh, teens 12 and older are invited. The cost is $25 per teen, and you will also need money for lunch. If you can't afford that, talk to Pastor Josh. He will get you that money through labor and uh, manual labor, more than likely. Uh, but it will be good for you. And the bus will leave the church at 1 and return around 5. If you need a ride, let Pastor Josh know. The sign-up sheet is on the back table. You need to sign up by Wednesday night. And uh, or uh, you're not going to be able to or he might not be able to get a ticket for you or whatever needs to be done there. And then we'll be having the Lord's Supper the Wednesday night before Easter, March 27th at 7 p.m. Downstairs in the fellowship hall, uh, make plans to attend the special service. We will not be live streaming this service. It's just going to be a time for those of us who are here to get together. The parking downstairs will be reserved for those who have trouble with the stairs. Uh, so if you have trouble with the stairs, you park out back and just use the basement entrance and the rest of us can go down the stairs. And then on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, we're going to have a special love offering. And if you can give, we have two big projects that need to get done this year if we can. And uh, we need the money so we can do it. And Brother Charlie Freeman, Brother Charlie Snyder are helping me with those two projects so they're going to get done right. And uh, so... Uh, if you are able to, please give towards that on Easter Sunday. And we're in need of Easter candy and Easter eggs for our annual Easter egg hunt for the kids. And if the word Easter offends you, then I'll read it this way. We are in need of resurrection candy and resurrection eggs for our annual resurrection egg hunt for the kids. So if you're able to help in any way, you can drop off at the church office. Aren't you glad we have liberty in Christ? We can call it Easter. We can call it Easter. We can, uh, whatever. But praise the Lord. Please help us out. We have liberty, but soon your liberty is going to be revoked of using our coat closet as a place to store your personal items because they are going to be relocated. Um, and uh, so you might want to re make sure you grab them. They might make it down to the free table first, so you still have a chance to get it. And then from the free table, we're, we don't, we're not responsible for your things. All right, and uh, that's all our announcements. Uh, Brother Zach will come sing, then we'll take our offering.
Song 805 now. 805, you can remain seated. Someone told me, Miss Yoli, this is her favorite song. She never gets to hear it. So we're going to sing it for Miss Yoli. Because he lives, let's sing all the verses. Song 805. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to Savior lives because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. job singing. Folks, let's pray for the offering. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for bringing us here today. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for springtime and the reminder that that is of the resurrection. I pray that you bless this offering in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and sing one more song. When I think of the resurrection, I think of this song. Hallelujah, what a Savior. 184, song 184. We'll stand, we'll sing all the verses. The song by Philip Bliss. Hallelujah, what a Savior.
good job. Say it. Shake your neighbor's hand. All righty, we'll find a way back to our seats. Amen. We'll find a way back to our seats. All right. James chapter 2. I will admit, I enjoy seeing it still light outside at almost 630. That's a blessing. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, and we'll start reading in verse 1. I, this afternoon, I was struggling. I had a sermon prepared for tonight. I actually had two different sermons. Either one I could have preached, but I didn't have any peace about either sermon, which I knew meant that I could have preached it, I could have trudged through it, and at the end of the, the day, I would have felt like, man, I shouldn't have preached that. Uh, so I came down this afternoon and, and wrote... Didn't know what I was going to preach, but then Brother Zach, during testimony time, was showing partiality to the right side over the left, so now I understand why I'm supposed to preach this sermon, uh, but James chapter 2, verse 1, says, My brethren, have not the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons? For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? And let's pray. Father, we thank you for being such a good God to us. We thank you for your word and for your example. 
and how you came to uh, revitalize the way your believers think and how they behave and how they treat other people. And I just pray that you would help us to examine our own hearts and own lives, our own church, as we look at this passage tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And you have to realize, in James' day, you know, in James, think about this. James, as far as we know, as what we've been given, James, who wrote the book of James, is the brother, the biological brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. He, same mother, different father, well, the same father, heavenly father, because he was saved, but Jesus Christ was the only begotten son of God. And the Bible teaches us that at first, the brothers of Jesus Christ did not accept him, but they came to accept him, and James was the biological uh, son of Mary and son of Joseph and a biological brother of Jesus Christ, and James is one of the earliest books that we have that we know was written um, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. James is one of the earlier books. Um, So just if you look at this, um, it says, my brethren... Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. The Lord of glory. Sounds like the brother of Jesus, the biological brother of Jesus who grew up with him, uh, is saying here, he's not just another man. He's not just a prophet. He's not just another person. He is the Lord of glory. That's saying he is deity. He is God. God. And that's who we serve. We serve Jesus Christ, the God of the universe. And uh, I just think that's an amazing thought right at the beginning. And he was, and he's teaching here, don't serve him and uh, with respect of persons. And we don't deal with this as much in our country as uh, they dealt with it back then. But back in the Roman days, 2000 years ago in Roman culture with between the Romans and the Jews, there was a caste system. There were the free man and the bond man. There was the Greek and the Hebrew, the barbarian. Uh, there were uh, the Gentile, the unclean, and there was a lot of racism and prejudice that went around. The Jews wouldn't talk to the Samaritans. Uh, the Romans who were free wouldn't talk to those that were in slavery. They, they treated them differently. And then Jesus comes along and preaches this message. He preaches it to the poor, to the halt, to the maim, to the blind, to the rejects of society. That just touches me. Where, you know, the Bible says that uh, not many wise are called, and not many strong, and not many mighty. And the call goes out to the poor, to the rejects first. And then maybe he'll fill in some spots with the mighty and the strong and the wise. Uh, But he came and he totally flipped flipped the script where the church and the priests and the rabbis of Jerusalem were trying to reach the wealthy and the well-to-do and the affluent. And they were trying to reach people that had uh, influence in society and they wanted to look smart and they wanted to look rich and they wanted to look wealthy. And Jesus rejected them and went to the dregs of society. And he helped those. And then we have a church forming. And and naturally, they want to give grace, more grace and favor to the rich and to the wealthy. Because that's what society did in those days. And they're trying to teach this church that they're not supposed to have respect to persons. If a man comes in who's rich and wealthy and has a golden ring and fair apparel, you're not supposed to give him the best seat in the house. And they'll tell the the poor person in vile raiment, go stand over there or here, sit here at my footstool. Maybe you can serve me. That's not how we're supposed to operate as a church. And we don't naturally have that, those same prejudices today in our society. But as a church, sometimes it can seem like that. So we have to be careful. We are not to be a respecter of persons and treat some people better than other people strictly based on their appearance or on their bank account or what vehicle they drive, whether it's a Ford or a Chevy. But someone should be able to come into Victory Baptist Church and not look like us and not smell like us. And maybe they have piercings or 
tattoos or colored hair or tattered or dirty clothes and be treated the same as you would treat a sharp-looking couple that walks through the door that has everything together and appears to have everything together. Because let me tell you this, we don't have it all together. Pastors can struggle with this because a person can come who looks sharp, looks the part, has money. I can't tell you how many times I've had visitors or people who just started coming make sure they go out of the way to let me know that they grabbed a tithing envelope. It's like, what do you want me to do, clap for you? You know, what do you, are you trying to impress me? Are you trying to think that somehow you grabbed a tithing envelope? Let me bow down and worship at your feet. Wow, congratulations, you joined the church, and uh, that's what we're supposed to do. You're not, you don't even have to grab a tithing envelope. But it's one of those things where uh, pastors sometimes can get caught up in that. But you know what I've found out? is sometimes the people who look the sharpest and act the sharpest and act like they have everything together and drive the nicest vehicles, they have the most hate and anger and bitterness they're harboring in their heart. And they're as wicked as hell on the inside. And they're wicked and angry and they're critical and they're divisive and they're judgmental and they're implacable, meaning they cannot be pleased. Bend over backwards for them. They're always going to want more. And then you have the poor. You have the ones that we have to pick up and bring to church because they can't afford their own ride to church. They're not divisive. They're not critical. They're happy to be here. They're, they're thankful for a place they can get a hot meal. But then you got the people who complain about what we serve on Sunday. You know, it's like, okay, I see where your heart's at. And a lot of times this person can come to church, and since this person looks nice and has money, the pastor will try to bend over backwards to appease this person and will show them an unlimited amount of kindness and compassion and mercy but then turn around and show no mercy to the weak or to the poor or to the broken. Now, I am not saying we ought to mistreat the rich and the wealthy and the affluent, but I'm saying we should treat the poor exactly the same that we treat the wealthy. We should not be a respecter of person. I believe both ought to be shown the same amount of compassion and grace and mercy. We cannot love people the way God would have us to love people and be partial in ourselves. Look at James chapter 2 again, verse 4. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Partial means biased, like favoring someone just because they sit on the right side. Um, anyways, praise the Lord. That was smart, though, because your wife sits on that side. So, smart man. Partial, you know, favoring one over the other. When we are partial... We condemn someone else unjustly and become judges of evil thoughts. I want to be patient and kind and loving to the rich person who appears to have his life in order, but I will not allow them to force me to be unkind or unloving or unmerciful to those who don't act like us, look like us, or smell like us. You know what I think? I think if a sharp-looking couple walks through that door and they have a kid in tow, and you just look at it and say, wow, they have their life together, and automatically you say, here, come sit in my seat. I'll give up my seat for you. I'm all for you giving up your seat, but you better do it for the homeless person that walks in too. Or you are a respecter of persons, and that's not the way we're supposed to operate. As a church, we need to watch out that we do not become partial towards a certain group. We need to be aware that we do not become a respecter of persons. Anyone should be able to walk in here and look like they just crawled out of a gutter, look like they just tripped and fell into a tackle box, and be treated with love and respect. Anyone. Colored hair, mohawk hair. I mean, we ought to be able to treat them with love and respect. And that's, to be honest with you, one reason why I love the Street Survivor Sunday School class with Brother Carl and Brother Willett. Because they love people. And they can go in there, and they, I know they're going to get the truth, but they're going to get it in love and patience. Where I think a lot of people that they deal with in the street survivor class, most, a lot of teachers here couldn't handle in their class. They have too many questions. They're, they're too distracted. 
And, uh, but they take the time to sit down with in, individually with these folks and deal with them on a personal level and show them love and compassion and kindness that is missing in a lot of churches. Why do we want to treat the poor and needy so well? Why do we want to treat the broken and the herded so well as a church? We'll look at James chapter 2, verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that loved him. Heaven is going to be full of them. Heaven is going to be full of the poor and needy. So you better get used to them now. Don't be so proudful and high-minded that you have no tolerance and patience for the poor. What was one of the number one criticisms that uh, the Pharisees of the day criticized Jesus Christ? He eats with publicans and sinners. How could he? If he says who he is, he is, how could he humble himself in such a way and eat with those the dregs of society? Eat with those people. Well, those are exactly the people he was trying to reach. If all we did was cater to the rich then and those with money and those with influence, it would hurt the church in the long run. It would hurt the church. Look at James chapter 2, verse 6. It says, but ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you? And draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. You know, the rich really don't care about the church. The rich really don't care about, the, for the most part, some do, and I'm thankful for that, but the love of money is the root of all evil. And sometimes rich people want to get their foot in the door, and they want to control things, and they want to be uh, have the pastor as their little puppet, so he just preaches what they want him to preach, and they can never be satisfied, they can never be satiated. The rich don't care about the poor, the rich care about themselves. They are selfish and self-centered You know, these politicians that are going to be running and talking about the poor and the middle class, they don't care about the poor and the middle class. They care about themselves. That's why they make so much money in politics when they're not supposed to even be making that much money, but they get paid a lot by people to push an agenda. And uh, so uh, we have to realize that when the rich person comes, and perfect example, I don't like all these bus kids running around. Preacher, I think you ought to get rid of these bus kids. We need to reach tithers not interested i want to reach people that are poor and that are needy because as you have done to the least of these you've done unto jesus christ he said suffer the little children to come that means put up with them make a way for the little children to come that's why i'm all for sunday school that's why i'm all for the bus route because you might be able to teach your children at home and teach them bible verses but what about all the children in lewiston and in auburn and in augusta that don't have a godly father at home don't have a godly mother at home they need a godly sunday school teacher that will bring them in and sit them down say well i just think sunday school is an opportunity for predators to get in and prey on children yeah guess what if it's done right it does not become that what we have is two people in a class teaching children and, and, and helping them grow in the Lord and showing the love of Christ to children who do not get it at home. So what should we do? Just say to hell with the children out there because they don't have a mom and dad that, that love God? No, we're going to suffer the little children. We're going to do everything in our power to bring them here, to put them under the influence of a bus captain, put them under the influence of bus workers who love them, put them in a Sunday school class with teachers that love them, in a junior church with a junior church preacher that loves them, in the church here with a pastor that loves them so that they can grow in Christ and have an opportunity to be saved, have an opportunity to grow. That's why I'm all for it. You know who doesn't want it? The rich people. They want to be able to sit in church, fan their pretty little fan, check their real expensive Rolex, and make sure the sermon doesn't go too long so they can get out of here as fast as possible and go on living for themselves for the rest of the week. It bothers them to see kids running around. It bothers them to see uh, uh, people sleeping in the pew. It bothers them to have people struggling with mental illness get up and leave the service and come back in and do all those different things. It bothers them because it puts them outside their comfort zone. It puts people in need in front of their eyes, and they have to look at them, where normally they just ignore them. 
And that's why they say, well, I don't think we should have them here. I don't think it's appropriate. Well, it's one of those things where we're not trying to reach the rich people. We're just trying to reach people. Red, yellow, black, white, rich, poor, bond, free. It doesn't matter. We are trying to reach them. With a rich person, a lot of times their comfort is the only thing they care about, and they will never be pleased. You know, they'll, they'll want to get rid of the poor kids, and uh, they won't be pleased. Hey, we need to change the preaching. You're scaring too many people. Oh, the pastor won't listen. We need to change the pastor. And then you got a head deacon running the church, and then he, does, he wants his little puppeteer. He can get in there. Uh, catering to the rich will ruin a church. As, as a church, we need to love everybody, rich and poor. Be patient with everybody. Be compassionate to everybody. Show mercy to everybody. Love the rich and the poor equally. Be just as excited when the bus comes in full than you are when you pull up with the bus and the parking lot's full of cars. Equally excited. We're reaching the driving crowd and the bus crowd. Be equally excited. You know, uh, look at James chapter 2, verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, I like how it calls it the royal law because Jesus Christ is our King of kings and Lord of lords. If ye fulfill the loyal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. This is where we want to be. We want to get that well done, thou good and faithful servant. And James is writing to the assembly here that, uh, of Hebrew believers, and he's saying, hey, if you just treat everyone with love and respect, and you treat everyone with compassion and mercy, you do well. That's how we're going to get that well done. Well, as a church, when we show compassion and mercy uh, to everyone, no matter their status, no matter their bank account, no matter what they're dressed like. But unfortunately, many of us can fall into verse 9 at times. Verse 9, but if you have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. You know, so we see two options here. We can either be a respecter of persons and show partiality towards a certain group, or we can just fulfill the law of Christ and love everyone, love our neighbor as ourselves. Those are the only two options. So in James chapter 3, verse 16 through 18, really spells it out for us. Beautifully. Look at James chapter 3, verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. So where you have envying, that's people not liking other people. Uh, when you have strife, people uh, fighting other people, there is confusion in every evil work. Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So verse 16 shows us this is what you're, you're going to get when you cater to the rich, when you cater to the person who wants the front seat, when you cater to the person who wants to be comfortable, when you cater to the person who wants to be served, and when you cater to the person who wants things just right, they don't want to be distracted, they don't want anything going on in the church they don't approve of, they don't want anyone in the church they don't approve of, they just want it to be their own little comfort zone. That's what you're going to get, envying and strife and confusion. But, verses 17 and 18, this is exactly what loving everyone will get you. It says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Peace produces peace. Strife will produce strife. Contention produces contention. But peace produces peace, full of mercy gentle. That's how we ought to treat people at church. And I'm glad that we do. Most of you here, I don't have any complaints. You are so kind. You are, and to a fault at times, where we see things happening, we're like, how long, Lord, do I have to suffer with these people? <laughs> I feel like Moses in the wilderness. You might feel like Moses, where, I mean, bless their hearts. And I've had people tell me, you know, there's this one person who rides a bus, they just sleep the whole time in church. 
you know what, I'd rather them sleep here than not be here at all. And many of you don't know the story behind, behind it. Or people say, well, you know, the baby's crying in the church. You know, I'm glad we have babies crying in the church. There's a lot of churches who don't have any babies crying because they don't have anyone in the church young enough to have a baby. It would be like Sarah having a miraculous conception if they bear children. Now, I'll take it. I'll take it. Well, it's just the people getting up and walking out during the preaching. Happens. When you have baby Christians, you have people who struggle, you have immature believers, going to happen. Sometimes you might have to get out for a reason. But you know what? You show them mercy. You show them compassion. And so they'd be like, you say, praise God they're here. Shake my head. I'm glad I'm not in a comfort zone where we just sit back and we get our little pom-poms out and we get a little lemonade and uh, it's just easy cruising. I'm glad that we have to put up with some things that I think Jesus would have to put up with if he was still roaming the streets today. The people who want to come and control everything and just they want the poor people to have their own church and the rich people to have their own church and not have to deal with it, they are wicked and evil men and women who would love to come to this church and throw their weight around, cause division, cause strife, sow contention, complain, and murmur. We will not cater to those people. We will love those people. We will show them the same love and compassion, and we will speak peaceably unto them. We will be gentle with them, but we're not going to cater to them. We will be kind and gentle and full of mercy to the one that disturbs the service, as well as to the one who gets very annoyed that the service is being disturbed. We are going to have to be willing to extend the same courtesy to others. That is why I'm okay with being patient with people and allowing them time to grow. There are some things that go on on Sunday that annoy the fire out of me. And if you get me talking, and me and Pastor Josh get talking about it, we'll get fired up pretty quick. But you know what we have to do when church time comes? Put on our our compassion and our loving kindness and say, I'm just thankful they're here. They drive me nuts, but I'm thankful they're here. And uh, so it's one of those things where we need uh, to allow people time to grow and time to mature because a lot of the things that are happening are people who are spiritually immature and they just need to grow. How are they going to grow except they hear the word of God preached? How are they going to grow unless they see it modeled by other mature Christians? But you know what they're learning from the mature Christians? How to be angry, how to be spiteful, how to complain and murmur and not be very gracious. So that's not what they should be learning. And, uh, you know, we need to have some patience, have some kindness, even if it's at our own inconvenience and our own discomfort. We need to be willing to sacrifice some of our own comfort and convenience for others. You know what that's starting to sound like? It's starting to sound like Christianity. When you sacrifice for the sake of others. Let's give people time to grow. Be patient with them. You know, and for, for instance, in the service here, let, let me address things in the service. And uh, if I think it's becoming too much of a distraction, I can preach through a lot. I can preach through people talking. I can preach through people getting up and moving. I can preach through a lot. You just focus on the preacher. And don't look at the distraction. Focus on the preacher. You know, let, let Pastor Josh help me address a lot of these issues that annoy you. And uh, let him deal with it. And he can handle those type of things. You know, I think of the bus kids with Brother Jimmy. Brother Jimmy, Miss Yoli, they do a great job with our bus kids. If you have a problem with the bus kid, bring it to Brother Jimmy, bring it to Miss Yoli. They will take care of it, and they'll do it gently, and they'll do it Christ-like and lovingly with compassion, and that's what we need. You know, I think of uh, Brother Carl with our ushers and our ushers. They, they can handle things. That's one reason why I chose these men and these ladies to be in the positions they are, because they have the fruits of the Spirit and the love and the compassion and the peace of God that they can talk to someone without getting angry. They can talk to someone without cussing them out. They can talk to someone without lose, flipping their lid because they, they're mature enough spiritually to handle those situations. If people are hanging out in the foyer and it bugs the fire of you, just go ask Brother Carl. Hey, Brother Carl, could you go talk to them or, or something? He'll handle it. He'll do a great job with it. And uh, so we have people in place that can handle those things because as a church, 
as a member of a church, I want you to come and enjoy the service and don't worry about what's going on around you. And just be thankful that there's kids here. Be thankful that there's distractions here. And be thankful that there's someone sleeping there. And be thankful that someone is, uh, smells like cigarette smoke over there because they're here. And there's worse places they could be. We need to be gentle, kind, and loving and not be a respecter of persons. Let some of the godly ladies we have here gracefully and kindly help a lady who needs a little direction. Having problems means we have people. Having the poor and needy means that we're rich in faith. And being patient and merciful and gentle gives us opportunity to be more like Jesus. Let me reread these last few verses and then I'll close. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. You know, if, if we love people, Without respect to persons, we're doing pretty well. So, a preacher, it's a circus here some Sundays. Yeah, but just remember, we're doing well in God's eyes. And those are the only eyes that I'm concerned with. So let's love people, rich and poor. Uh, those who have it all together and those who don't have it together. Let's show them gentleness and kindness and patience. And they'll grow. Given enough time, they'll grow. And there's no telling what God could do with them. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for being such a good God to us. I thank you that you came down and led by example as uh, you ate with the publicans and the sinners. You touched people that were unclean and allowed people who were unclean to touch the hem of your garments and they were healed. And you did not rebuke them, but you praised them for their faith. You had church services interrupted. Your teaching interrupted by people tearing the roof off and letting their friend down. And you did not rebuke them. You praised their faith. Because it's the poor that are rich in faith. And Lord, I just pray that we would follow in your footsteps as a church. And as much as we'd love to come and be comfortable, and we'd love to come and hear every word, and we'd love to come just to enjoy a service, help us to realize that the folks that sometimes make it a little tough to come to church are the exact people we need here to help us to be more like Christ. And you're blessing us with the poor. You're blessing us with the needy. Help us not to cater to the rich. Help us not to cater to those that have the influence. But help us to love people like you'd love people, rich and poor. Those that are, have it all together and those who don't. Those who are dressed nice and those who have vile raiment. Help us to treat them all the same because we just want to do well. And we thank you for what you're going to teach us. Piano's going to play, so I'll stand to our feet. The Holy Spirit spoke to your heart. Why don't you come forward? Maybe you say, Lord, I, I've been kind of a respecter of persons. I've been letting people get under my skin, and I've been being maybe not so Christ-like. And I need to check my heart. I've been getting impatient and unkind. I get more excited when a sharp-looking family comes to the door than I do when a bus kid comes to the door. I know, I, I get there. I deal with the same problem in my heart. Sometimes when someone comes to the door, I roll my eyes and I pray for grace. And I just say, why, Lord? Why today? And that's not the right attitude. We need to love, have compassion, be gentle towards all men all people be thankful that they're here the poor might not have much to offer but the bible says they're rich in faith
Lord, I thank you for this truth from your word. And it just amazes me to think about what you had to come and deal with during the time that you chose to came, all the prejudices and the hate that went on during those days between the Jews and the Samaritans and the Romans and, and all the different classes of people. And uh, you came and you loved the poor. You loved the reject. You loved the outcast. And you gave us an example. And I don't know why in the world we want to take this church and use it to reach rich people and to cater to rich people when you showed us the exact opposite. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to just check our hearts at the door on Sunday. Make sure we're ready to come to a church and, and show love and kindness and gentleness and goodness to those that we don't think deserve it, for those who don't look like us and act like us and smell like us, just knowing that if we do that, you're going to be pleased and we're doing well. Even if we feel like sometimes it can be a circus and it can be chaos and it's a lot more work than we signed up for, at the end of the day, you're pleased. And if you're pleased, we do well. And we thank you for what you've given us in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Song 562. We'll close the service. We'll sing the first and last verse, Just As I Am, Song 562. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood washes for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as Thank you for coming to church tonight. I hope you all get an extra hour of rest tonight as you go home and uh, sleep for an extra hour and uh, whatever you need to do. But uh, praise the Lord for today. It's good to see you all here. It's good to see some of the Sullivans made it. They're feeling better. Amen. That's exciting. And uh, Brother Sullivan, will you close us in prayer? We'll be dismissed. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming.